Oh, hello, everyone. How are you doing? Are you awake? Last uh, uh, talk of the day, it's always, uh, you, you get very tired. I spoke in the last slot yesterday, and I made everyone get up and jump up and down. Do I need to make you do that, or will you stay awake for this? Yes? Okay. All right. Oh, you want me to do it? Okay, everyone up then. Everyone stand up. No, no. Okay. All right. I won't do that to you. Okay. Well, uh, this is a real treat for me. Um, I, I started life as a Java developer. I actually started life as a Microsoft developer. I need to clarify, but um, I've been doing a lot with Java. My first book was on JBoss at work for O'Reilly, and so I've done a lot of server-side Java development, and certainly as well as client-side. But I discovered Groovy, and I never turned back. Groovy was a wonderful language, a dynamic language. How many of you are using Groovy right now? Oh, a couple of you. All right. How many of you have never used Groovy before in your life? Ah, welcome to an advanced Groovy talk. Hold on to your head, especially the top, because the top of your head will be blown off by what I'm going to show you here. I apologize in advance, but I've been speaking about Groovy here for three years running, and I thought rather than giving, continuing to give the same beginning Groovy talk over and over again, I would give an advanced talk. When I come back next year, maybe I'll do both, a beginning and an advanced Groovy talk. But this is certainly a more advanced Groovy talk. I don't think it'll surprise you, or I, I, don't, I don't think uh, it will um, uh, hurt you too badly. I think that you'll be in, you'll be in very good shape. What I love about Groovy is it allows me to continue to call myself a Java developer because Groovy actually runs on top of Java. This is a language that still runs on the JVM. This is literally one additional jar file you need to add to your class path, the Groovy all jar. And if you're doing Hibernate development, you need to include Hibernate in your class path. If you're doing JUnit testing, you need to include the JUnit jar in your class path. If you're doing Groovy development, you're going to need to include the Groovy jar in your class path. The only difference between Groovy and Hibernate, or Groovy and JUnit and Groovy or any other library, is that libraries still follow all of the syntactic rules of Java. Whereas Groovy is a new language and it actually has its own compiler, just like you Java, your Java code to compile it, you Groovic, your code, Groovy C to compile your Groovy code. But what's very important, I will show you at the bytecode level, is that Groovy code, once it's compiled, is bytecode. It is binary compatible with Java. And let me tell you one more thing before we get into the features here, is that Groovy is a perfect superset of Java. When we talk about uh, the AST, the abstract syntax tree, what Groovy starts with is the Java AST, all of the keywords of Java, all the language features and syntactic rules of Java, and then adds its new keywords and language features on top of Java. So what's very nice is you're already Groovy programmers and you didn't realize it. You can take any one of your Java classes, any one of your Java classes, and rename the extension from .java to .groovy, and you now have a perfectly valid Groovy file. Does that make sense? Because there are lots of other languages that run on the JVM. You can run JRuby on the JVM. But JRuby is not syntactically compatible with Java. It's syntactically compatible with Ruby. So what JRuby allows you to do is take your Ruby code, compile it, and run it unchanged on the JVM. What uh, Jython allows you to do is take your Python code and run your Python code unchanged on the JVM. There are also entirely new languages, Scala allows you to take Scala code and run it on the JVM. Clojure, which is getting a lot of hype these days, Clojure is a Lisp. It allows you to run Lisp on the JVM, but Lisp looks nothing like Java, does it? Scala looks somewhat like Java, but it's its own language. And this is what makes Groovy unique among, and I'm not exaggerating, the tens and tens, hundred or so languages that run on the JVM. Groovy is the one that was not targeted at existing Ruby developers or existing Python developers. It was targeted at existing Java developers, allowing them to take their Java code and extend it. So that's my very short version of an introduction to Groovy. Does that make sense?
Yes. So as a beginning groovy class, what I like saying is I like calling that blue pill groovy. There's blue pill and red pill groovy. What am I talking about when I'm talking about blue pill and red pill? It's a, it's a, it's a reference to... Ah, thank you very much. It's, some people say Alice in Wonderland, and that's fine, but yes, The Matrix is the real one. If you didn't understand that reference, I might have to ask you to leave. That is a very important geek movie that we all should have watched and memorized, right? And if you remember in, in The Matrix, if you take the blue pill, you go back to your regular life as a programmer. But if you take the red pill, you have superhero powers and you can save the world. So my beginning Groovy talk is my blue pill talk where I say, here are things you can do in Groovy that look very much like Java. This is a red pill talk. This now looks... Nothing like Java. It gives Java superpowers in order to extend these things. I think I've lost my mind. Mm -hmm. I'll continue shouting while we do some uh, troubleshooting here. That's right. I never did it before. So it just turns down. I do have a loud voice. That's no problem at all. So again, let me now um, compare and contrast Groovy and Java. Java is predicated on this a class hierarchy. If you came to my JavaScript talk earlier, we say that Java is a strongly typed language. We know that the base class is object, and then everything extends from object. And this is how we share behavior among classes. You can define methods on a higher level class, and if you extend that class, you automatically inherit that behavior. That's all. Not news to you at all, is it? That's standard Java 101. While that's very powerful, there can be a problem with that. And it's called the fragile base class problem. Which means what if you want to inherit some methods from one class, parent class, and some methods from another parent class? Are you able to extend two classes? Not at all. You only get one parent. What is this? A platypus. Exactly. So if I were in Java and I was trying to model the world in Java, I would create a mammal class that gives birth to live children, and I would create a reptile class that lays eggs. Right? This is the way the world works, except when we look at a duckbill platypus. A duckbill platypus is warm-blooded, but lays eggs. Let me give you one more example. Are there any venomous mammals that you know of? There are lots of venomous reptiles, aren't they? Snakes and lizards and such. A duckbill platypus is actually venomous. So this is the fragile base class problem in a nutshell. What base class could I use for a platypus that shares some characteristics of reptiles and some characteristics of mammals? It's a tough problem to solve with a single class inheritance model, isn't it? And that doesn't mean you shouldn't ever use that. But what I love about Groovy, Groovy is a perfect superset of Java. So we can continue to use all of the same things we did in Java. It still supports class inheritance, but it also allows us to do metaprogramming, which allows us to bolt new methodology on. And what this means, the other languages call these mix-ins. And so if I define the platypus class, I could extend mammal, but mix in reptile and get those same behaviors. Does that make sense? Yes, excellent. Okay. That said, this gives your Java classes superhuman power. This is a great example of a mix-in, right? This is both a man and a machine. So... Let's take a look at this. I have a lot of stuff to get through here. There are two types of metaprogramming we can do, runtime metaprogramming and compile time metaprogramming. For runtime metaprogramming, we can use categories, the expando meta class, and method missing. For compile time programming, we can use AST transformations. So there will be lots of code examples. I'm going to apologize to you in advance. This is a 90-minute talk that I am fitting into 45 minutes. 
So all of this code is available online. If you go to github.com, G-I-T-H-U-B, github.com, my username is scottdavis99. You can download these slides and all of the code. You can certainly get that from the GIDS website as well. But github.com slash scottdavis99. Since I'm going to go through this very quickly, you'll be able to download all my slides and source code and evaluate it at your leisure after the conference this evening. So let's begin. Let's talk about categories. Categories are interesting animals. And they actually came to us from Objective C. Technically, they came to us from Smalltalk, and Smalltalk stole it from, or, or excuse me, Objective C stole it from Smalltalk, and Groovy stole it from Obj C. Do you know how Groovy got its name? There's a programmer. Uh, James Strachan was the originator of the language, and he was doing a little Python work. And if you've ever done any Python work, you know that triple quotes allow you to define multi-line strings. And he was a Java programmer, and he said, ah, oh, I wish Java had multi-line strings. Wouldn't it be cool if Java had multi-line strings? And then he looked at the way JavaScript did metaprogramming, string.prototype.new method. He says, wouldn't it be neat if Java had metaprogramming like that? And wouldn't it be awesome if Java had this Ruby feature? And wouldn't it be groovy if I could have all of these different language features, but not have to learn Python, but bring Python features to Java, and bring JavaScript features to Java, and bring Ruby features to Java, and so on and so forth. And so groovy got its name. Um, from, from that, and so it's not surprising at all that this first style, this is the original style of metaprogramming in Groovy, category-based, was stolen shamelessly from Objective-C. So I'm giving you lots of details here, but the important thing here is a category collects method implementations into separate files. So if I had my platypus here, I could have lays egg as a method in another class, and then I could mix those two together. Yes? Now, a more realistic example, we'll get out of this silly platypus example here, and they say, for instance, one could create a spell checking category. There are a number of methods that would be associated with that. Now, we have strings in Java, Java link strings, so it would be very nice to combine this functionality so every string we could call the dot spell check method on it and bring those things together. Do you see what I'm saying now? Does this feel like the robotic arm that we're talking about? Mixing these features together. We have a problem, though. Java lang string is an evolutionary dead end because it was declared final. What does final mean? Can I extend string now? Absolutely not. Is there a stringable interface that I can implement? No. So Sun made sure that there was nothing we could do to string. There's no way that we can possibly add a spell check method to this existing class. <laughs> they didn't anticipate Groovy coming to the party, did they? So rather than implementing my own string utilities, I'm going to take advantage of the commons lang string utils. How many of you use commons lang? It's wonderful, isn't it? It's a collection of methods that you wished existed on the string library, but don't. There are wonderful methods like abbreviate and capitalize each word and things like that. Now, the way you have to implement that in Java is by passing a string into a library. Now, this library can be used for category metaprogramming because all of the library methods follow two simple patterns. All of the methods are static in that library. I'm going to show you the library in just a moment here. So when we are looking at abbreviate, we can see that's a static method. Abbreviate middle, capitalize all words. Those are all static methods. So that's one thing that passed nicely. The other thing is that the first argument must be of the same data type as the delegate. Now, delegate's a new key word. It's a new concept. We don't have this idea in Java. We can't say that string utils extend string because string is final. But what we can do is we can say that the string is our delegate. And this is the method, abbreviate, that we're going to metaprogram onto the delegate. And since this is a static method that accepts a string as its first argument, 
these two classes, Java Lang String and String Utils, were both written years before Groovy was invented. So they didn't write these libraries with Groovy in mind. These are two pure Java libraries, but we're going to use Groovy to mix them together. So again, in Java, this is what it would look like. Here is my sentence, and then I would have to use string utils.abbreviate to pass the sentence in to get that abbreviation down there. Now, this is perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with it, but it doesn't feel very object-oriented, does it? So if you wanted to take a more object-oriented approach, what we would do is this. Use is a new block that we have, much like a try-catch block or an if block or a for loop or anything else. But what we're saying is I'd like to use the string utils class. And what happens now is inside of this block, we are now scoped to that block, inside of this block, the string class gains, I almost said inherited, but that's not the right word, right? All of the methods of string utils are applied to the string class, so I can just call sentence.abbreviate, and it runs. Isn't that cool? Isn't that nice? Yes. So that is how we do category-based metaprogramming. That was the first way we were able to do this in Groovy. Now, yes, sir? So if there the, the question is, I'm going to repeat it since you don't have Mike. So what would happen in the string utils class if there were non-static methods? They wouldn't appear at all. So the only way category-based metaprogramming works is if you have static methods that accept the delegate as a first argument. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Um, this is a good question. The question is, can we override existing methods? Is there some way I could override to string or override starts with or something like that? Um, I believe so. In the next way I'm going to show you, I can say absolutely yes. So I would tend to believe that this would allow me to override as well. This is actually an older version of this, and, and this isn't used very popular. I'm going to show you a much more idiomatic way to do this metaprogramming. And in that sense, I can say absolutely, without question, I can override existing classes. Or excuse me, I'll write existing methods on a class. It makes it wonderful for unit testing, doesn't it? If you're trying to unit test a class that makes a really expensive SOAP call, and in a unit test you don't want it to make that call, using the expando meta class, you would be able to override the expensive SOAP call with your own mocked out method. So I'm 99.9% .9 sure that categories would be the same, but I am 101% sure that this way does it. Okay? It's a wonderful question. Thank you for asking. So Groovy 1.0 gave us categories. Groovy 1.1 gave us an expando meta class. And so how that looks is this. I have a message like I love Groovy, and notice it's in lowercase down here. If I say string.metaclass.shout, and I referred to this in my talk uh, earlier today, if you're a JavaScript programmer, JavaScript supports metaprogramming like this as well. The only difference is in JavaScript you would say string.prototype.shout. I mentioned this in, in, in my talk. My last talk was JavaScript for Java developers. I didn't like JavaScript until I learned Groovy. And then as I learned Groovy, I looked at JavaScript with new eyes, and I said, oh, my goodness. This is beautiful. And again, Groovy, the language, got its name because James Strachan said, I love the way JavaScript does metaprogramming, and so we will uh, uh, grab that uh, feature and bring it back into the Java language. But let's deconstruct this for a moment. The m first thing we have to realize is if you tried to call message without without doing the metaprogramming, yeah, is this on? Check one, two. All right. If I were to do something like this, what would you expect to happen? 
you'd probably expect the runtime to say, shout, what on earth are you talking about? There is no signature of method shout on a string. And since string is final, you might think you are out of luck. But now that we have Groovy at our disposal, I can come in and run this now, and all of a sudden, oh my goodness, I'm shouting. So let's deconstruct the syntax and see if we can make sense of it. So I have added a shout method to string, but I can't add it to string directly because string is final. So what I have to do is add it to the strings meta class. In Groovy, every Java class, every Groovy class, every class in general not only has a core class, the delegate, but it also has, let's see if I can pull this off. Here we go. Arr, arr, there we go. An expando meta class that's surrounding the delegate. I must look like an idiot up here doing this. Uh, I hope, are you getting this all on camera? I hope this is what they use on the big signs outside of the things. We'll get Scott going like this for his next talk, yes. But the idea is the expando meta class surrounds the delegate. So as you're sending messages, as you're making method calls against your class, it will hit the meta class first. And if the method exists, it will return. If it hits the meta class and the, class does, the method doesn't exist, it will go through to the delegate and use the delegate's call and return. And only in the case of shout, if there wasn't a shout on the meta class and wasn't a shout on delegate, would it return that method missing exception. So this is the answer to your very good early question uh, earlier. This is how we can use this in a unit testing context as well. So this is how expandable metaprogramming works. And what's wonderful about this is by Affecting the meta class of string, I now affect all subsequent strings that I knew of. This takes effect for all classes. I can also do instance level metaprogramming, which is especially powerful in a unit testing context. I probably don't want to override this behavior on every one of my classes that's making an expensive SOAP call. I want to new up this class and override that instance's expensive SOAP call and then let it get garbage collected away. And so notice how we did this here. Now I call message.metaclass.shout, and wonderful, I'm shouting my message, but if I have some arbitrary string and try to shout that, I get the dreaded missing method exception. Now, as a Java programmer, this would normally get caught at compile time, wouldn't it? But this is runtime metaprogramming. So what that means is we don't catch it until we invoke the code. This is why unit testing is not optional as a modern programmer. Because as we're doing this metaprogramming, we need to have unit tests that exercise all this code. Because the Java compiler gives you a false sense of security. The Java compiler at best told you you didn't make any syntax errors. That's kind of like saying you must be this tall to be a Java programmer. You need to spell all your words correctly and put a semicolon at the end of every line. That's not very rigorous testing, is it? So even as Java developers, unit testing is not optional. So let's talk about this method missing. Yes. Um, the current version of Groovy is 1.8. The question was, is this a recent innovation? So categories came in Groovy 1.0, which was released in 2005, I think, late 2005, December, if I'm not mistaken. And Expando Meta Class has been around since Groovy 1.1. So it's well established, and that is the idiomatic way you'll do metaprogramming in Groovy. So we're at Groovy 1.8 right now, so it's been through uh, uh, Groovy. We went from Groovy 1.0 uh, to 1.1 to 1.5 to 1.6 to 1.7 to 1.8. So. Yes? Yeah, I was going to say. There is. You can begin capturing those things, but most of the time what you'll do is you'll do instance-level metaprogramming and throw away the instance. It's much easier. There, there are ways you can capture that, but it's usually not worth the effort. New up a new instance, override it, and then throw it away. Fair enough? You're asking very good questions. So we're talking about method missing. Let's continue this. And let's not just let those exceptions get thrown. You might think that you'd have to wrap it in a try-catch. But we know that catching exceptions is extraordinarily expensive, isn't it? 
We don't want to use ex exceptions as a normal path through our code. We want to have an exception be an exceptional experience, like the server's on fire right now. You might want to check in the server room. Yes? And so what Groovy gives us the ability to do is deal with methods that don't exist in a programmatic way. So let's start with an invoke method. Method. What invoke method allows you to do, and this is since Groovy 1.0, it allows you to intercept all method calls against a class. This is a poor man's point cut, isn't it? If you set up an invoke method on your class, every method co being called on that gets intercepted. Now, in this case, what you might do is write out a log statement or print out an error or something like that and then go ahead and pass through to the delegates method. This only works, of course, because we have the meta class surrounding the delegate. So there are a lot of interesting libraries in there. The Groovy XML Markup Builder uses this to great effect. What you're able to do is build up a structure in Groovy, right? Records with a car that has a name and a make and a year. And that emits well-formed XML on the other end. It's because when we new up this XML object, it doesn't have a records method. And it doesn't have a car method or a name method or a make or a year or anything else like that. So this is using exclusively invoke method. It's intercepting every single method on that. And it's saying, oh, if I don't recognize it, that must be an XML element. Does that make sense? It's very, very powerful. And I'm spending less and less time dealing with XML these days and more and more time with JSON in Groovy 1.8. Now, remember, 1.0 gave us an XML builder. Only the very latest uh, dot release, Groovy 1.8, I'm running 1.8.6, but in the 1.8 series, we got a JSON builder. So we can do the same kind of thing here. I can build up a message with a header and a from and to, and it will emit well-formed JSON on the other end. Now, this is fully bi-directional. I don't have time to give you all the examples here, and I do apologize about that. But not only can we build XML, but they have XML slurpers. I kid you not. XML slurpers that read that in. And there are also JSON slurpers that will slurp an existing JSON. So as we're doing web services, I'm working at Time Warner Cable right now. I've got a team there. And all of the cable set-top boxes emit JSON. So we're using gro Groovy Slurpers to slurp in that JSON, and then we're using gro JSON Builders to mock out the services as we're unit testing on the uh, cable set-top boxes. Very powerful constructs here. And you can even do just any arbitrary thing like that. Notice I'm going to new up a person here, and I'm just going to say Scott married Kim, Scott knows Neil, Scott worked with Brian. I didn't have Venkat on this slide. I should. I need to update my slide deck clearly. But none of these methods exist. Married node, work with knows, any of these kinds of things. And what that means then is I can grab those things, and in this case I'm just arbitrarily building up a hash map to do this. Very powerful concept. So whereas invoke method... Invoke method intercepted every single call. Method missing just captures the calls that are about to throw that method missing exception. So if I were to do something like this, if I were to have a method missing in here, and notice the syntax, the method call, and the args that come in, this would allow me to write code that looks like this. This is a very traditional Java way of playing a particular song. iPod play, dig a pony. What Groovy would allow you to do is say iPod play two of us. iPod play some other song, things like that. And again, this is where we begin getting into DSLs, isn't it? Domain specific languages? Yeah. I've been missing my time check. What, how much time do we have left? Ten minutes. Thank you very much. We are in perfect shape. Um, any questions about invoke method or method missing? Yes. Why am I surprised that you have a question? No, I'm kidding, of course. Huh. 
Absolutely, absolutely. So if you've done any Grails development, you know that you can use these method missings not to play two of us, but if I have a book class in Grails, Grails is a web framework that's implemented in Groovy. If I have a book class and book has an author field, I can say book, book, find all by author, Venkat. And under the covers, that gets transformed into SQL statement and pulls those out. I can say book.findall by author and year and pass in Venkat and 2011, and it would only return three or four books. He's an amazingly fast author. Yeah, so we have all of these things. So absolutely, this is something that Grails uses extensively to give you this very nice way to write queries, not in a SQL language, but in a very comfortable DSL language like this. Super. Now, we have talked about the Expando Meta class. Let's take this to an extreme, not just an Expando Meta class, but an Expando. And what this means is an Expando is a brand new class that has zero fields and zero methods on it. And so what that means is every time you call a setter on that, that expando now has a field named name, and the value is Yerk. It also has a new method called greeting, where it says, hello, my name is Dirk. And so we can see this is very JavaScript-like, isn't it? In JavaScript, you start with an empty object, and you add fields to it, and you add methods to it. And so an expando is bringing that JavaScript functionality back to Java, via Groovy, so you start with a blank slate and build up your class instead of predefining your class fields and methods and instantiate it from there. I'm not arguing that one is better than the other, but this gives you an incredible amount of flexibility when you're saying, I don't really know, for example, what JSON is going to come from the set-top box. We're doing very rapid iterations, and so if I were doing this in Java, every time they revved the set-top box and added new fields or pulled out fields, all of my code would break, and it would become a maintenance nightmare trying to keep my Java class in sync with whatever JSON comes out of that set-top box. So we use these kinds of expandos extensively saying, I don't know what this class is going to hold. Let's ask the set-top box what this class holds, and we will pour all that data in there, and then poof, I have a well-formed class. Instantly upgradable to any version that the, of JSON that the set-top box is going to send my way. Really powerful concept. Yes? Okay. So then, all of those examples I gave you, whether it was category-based metaprogramming or it was using the expando meta class string.shout or it was invoke method or method missing or even just an expando in general. All of those changes happen at runtime. AST transformations were a very recent addition to the language and what's incredibly interesting about these is these are compile time metaprogramming features. And the reason why this is so important is because it does this metaprogramming not in the expando meta class that only exists at runtime. It does it in the bytecode. And what that means is Java can participate in that metaprogramming experience as well. You were asking about Groovy, excuse me, Grails. In Grails 2.0, they've moved many of those dynamic finders into AST transformation, so your Java classes can begin finding book dot find all by author and year as well. So whereas runtime, just as it stands, only exists in memory, compile time metaprogramming exists at the bytecode level. So let's explore this. 
There are a number of different things you can do. One of them I like is the immutable AST transformation. And so what that means is you define a class and you just throw at immutable. These are annotations. You throw at immutable on the top and it transforms the byte code into what you would expect an immutable class to be. It would make the class final. It would make all the fields final. It would build out your constructor so you have to pass the values into the constructor. It only gives you getters. It doesn't give you setters. That's an awful lot for just saying class, person, string, name, string, city, at immutable. But let me give you some other examples here. Delegate is an interesting one. There's a silly word again, isn't it? We begin seeing these patterns repeat themselves. But what a delegate does is it allows you to take one of these classes fields. So this is a class named event. But I have a class of date type. I want my event to behave like a date. But let's suppose for a minute that date was a final class. I couldn't extend date. So what the at delegate annotation does is it takes all of the date methods and pushes it up to the parent class. Now, this doesn't truly make your class a date, but what it does is it makes it walk like a duck and quack like a duck. It gives it all the behavior of a date without giving it the true class type. Does that make sense? Yes. So here's another one, and this is a very simple example that we can demonstrate for you. Let's suggest that I want to create a brand new type of class. It's called an all cap string. We have wanted this every once in a while. It tended to be when we were dealing with older databases. We said, you know what? No matter what values come to the at delegate transformation, what it would look like is this. Here is my class, all cap string. And I'm going to have a private field called body. Now, that body is of string type. And I'm going to make it final. And I'm going to use at delegate, which is going to push all the string methods up to all strings. Now I'll give myself a nice constructor so I can construct this. I made string final, so this is the only way I'll be able to set it. And then I overrode the toString method so it would return my body to uppercase instead of the normal string. Let's look at how this looks. Uh, where am I going? What am I doing? What's my name? Who am, where am I at? I've lost my mind. All right, here we go. So if I come in here right now, and look at cat string. It's very simple, isn't it? I, I tried to shrink this down to the bare minimum so we could see that cat string normally wouldn't have any methods at all. But if I have a field and I delegate those values, notice what I've done here. I've compiled cat string to a Java class. I use Groovy C, Groovy C to give this. And then I'm going to use Java P. Are you familiar with Java P? Java P is part of the JDK. It allows you to peruse the bytecode. Um, it's a bytecode inspector. So if I use Java P on cap string, we will see that indeed this public class cap string extends all of the classes that string extends. It implements all of the interfaces that Java Lang string implements. It also implements the Groovy Lang Groovy object interface. But the really important thing is you'll notice all of those methods got pushed onto the parent. Yeah? If I break that, yeah? It's not being delegated anymore. So if I come back in here and I groove it, my all, uh, this is just cap string. If I groove it, my cap string dot groovy, I end up with cap string dot class. And notice that was created right here. And then if I Java P, my cap string, I don't have any of those string methods available anymore. These are just the default methods you get when you extend Java Lang object. So if I go back once again and say that was a terrible idea. <laughs>
this is a much better idea. I want to delegate string. I will Groovic my code, and I will Java P my code. And that's what adds those methods back. You begin seeing the real sophistication of this. All of what we're trying to do in this presentation the entire time is dance around this idea of classical, class-based, single-parent inheritance. Yeah? I'm saying that's still available to us, but I don't need to show you how to do that because that's what you've been doing all this time. I'm doing every possible variation on a theme I can give you to show you different ways we can mix in this additional capabilities. And what AST transformations allow us to do is do the metaprogramming and bytecode so Java classes can now do this. Yes, sir. Can you have more than one delegate? It's rarely done, but I believe you can. This is another, this is a very good question. I wish I could say with 100%. I'm going to say I am 74.5% sure that you can have more than one delegate. Um, you can, absolutely, very good. The, the one thing I'd have to really explore is what happens when the same method is implemented on both classes. Is it a, li is it a LIFO? Is it last in, first out? Is it the order it's defined? I don't know. I'd have to write unit test to, to determine that. Normally what you're trying to do, though, is you're trying to extend a final class. So the common use case for this is saying, hey, I want to extend string. It's final. I can't do it. Let me make string a delegate. And so I will quack like a duck, walk like a duck. But yeah, um, it's nice to know. Thank you for uh, confirming that. Yeah, um, being able to have multiple delegates, the one thing you'd have to be concerned about is um, uh, uh, multiple method overriding. Yeah, very good question. So remember we started the day talking about categories? and we would wrap it in a use block. We had string utils up there, and we used string utils to metaprogram the abbreviate method onto string. Well, that's how we did it in Groovy 1.0. Now in Groovy 1.8, we could do that same kind of thing. This is where we would say, all right, I'm using my number category, so every distance now has a get meters method on it, yeah. What you can do now is this. And this does exactly the same thing, but it's much cleaner syntax, isn't it? You're defining it on the class, not on the usage of the class. And so this gives you much better reuse. If you forget to ring, r r wrap string in string utils, you're not going to get those abbreviate methods anymore. You have to do that with intent. If you, in your class, used at category string utils, and let me show you an example of that. ASD transformations. I was going to get there. I only had one left. Where is it? Come on now. Come on. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. I know it's in here. There we go. I'm going to, oh, this isn't the example I wanted to give you, but at grab is another interesting annotation in here. By doing this, what it does is this includes commons lang on the class path. I no longer have to add jars to my class path. What it does is it bakes all of those methods into this class, and so then I can just use string utils. But I do have another example, and I can't believe I am, I am, blind right now and not finding it. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. There we go. By using the at category now, this is identical in terms of behavior in using a use strings like that. But what I'm doing is using the at category annotation to give you the same thing. So now anytime I use test string, I would be able to turn around and call capitalize all words or abbreviate or anything else. And what's nice, the reason I can do this is because it's baking all those methods into the byte code so that even Java classes will get that same behavior. Yes? 
So much to do in so little time. I just got the you're out of time sign, so I apologize, but I will be here afterwards to answer questions. But we covered 90 minutes of material in 45 minutes. That's worth a round of applause, isn't it? Yeah. Thank you once again. I hope you enjoyed yourself today. I hope to see you back here next year. Safe travels.